Happy Valentine's, everyone. My name is Erin Payton. I am the Executive Director of the 19th Century Charitable Association, which is located in Oak Park, Illinois. Our mission is strengthening our community through learning, giving, and the sharing of our landmark building. And we have a wonderful program for you today in conjunction with Writing Matters. We have Richard Ford, the author, will be speaking with Bill Young. And before I give their bios, I just wanted to let you know that if something sparks a question or a comment, you can put that right in our chat or our Q&A. And if there's time at the end of the program, we might unmute you and you can ask your question or give your comment right to the two gentlemen. So now I'm just gonna give you a wonderful bio for each of our presenters. Richard Ford is the author of The Sports Writer and Independence Day, for which he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize and the Penn Faulkner Award. He is the winner of the Prix Femina in France, the 2019 Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, and the Princess of Asturias Award in Spain. He is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Canada. His short story collections include the bestseller, Let Me Be Frank With You, Rock Springs, and A Multitude of Sins. Bill Young is a proprietor of Midwest Media, an author services company providing escorting and support to most of the authors visiting Chicago and the surrounding areas. Since 1987, he's traveled around the Midwest with thousands of authors. In the late 1980s, he was the producer host of the baseball show during the early days of cable television. A longtime resident of Oak Park, Bill recently became a member of the 19th Century Charitable Association, and boy, are we grateful that he has. Without further ado, let's bring Bill and Richard to the program so we can listen to them speak. Great to be here, Aaron. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, Richard. Hello, Bill. Great uh, to see your face. It's great to see your face. And I just wanted to, uh, preparatory, you were going to be our guest last Father's Day. So this is a, a long time in coming. Uh, we've we've bridged the pandemic and, uh, and are finally here on another holiday. So happy Valentine's Day. Thank you very um, much. I was I was honored to get to even think about coming last last spring. Well, that was in the publication for this book. Uh, yeah. Sorry for your trouble. And now, two days from now, it's going to be out in paperback. So it's actually a second kind of uh, new release of Second Life. Second Life. Uh, before we get into your career, your life, uh, and everything we've done, uh, let set the stage for this book sorry for your trouble it's uh it's a collection of nine stories freestanding stories uh a lot of recurring themes which i'll get to in a moment but it seems like the operative word in here is trouble how would you define or link the stories of these of, of this book well <clears throat> they're all between two two covers that's one thing i'd say about them um uh, but you know, when you're when you're writing stories, when you're writing novels, you're always looking for sources of drama, and so and these are domestic stories by and large. They're about people who are married and have been married and who are in love and who have been in love, um, and so um, the, the ways in which human intimacy can go off the rails is is generally what I'm interested in, um, and and that's and that's the source of drama and that's the source of trouble. Uh, it, the, the, that. I, that is the trouble that these stories bespeak, um, the death of a spouse, the, the absence of a spouse, the absence of someone who's, who's, who's um, been loved and who wishes he or she was loved. I, I think that the reason for writing the stories is just not to put that on display. Um, in a way, you almost don't need to put that on display. It's all around us all the time. But the, but the stories try to find some vocabulary for renewal at their ends. So that when when all of these things happen to people, as 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 do, uh, the, I'm always looking when I get to the end of the story to say what what can I what can I say good, what can I say has made this experience worth telling. So that's that's what unifies them, I guess. Well, what I was going to ask you too is is and I'll get to it uh, when we start talking about the novels and Frank Baskin, but uh, the stories are a snapshot. These stories are between ten and sixty pages. Uh, they take place as, in as short a time as two hours with the crossing and a couple of just overnights. Uh, the longest time span in here is the last story. Uh, 
which is a, a marriage over two years. So you take this, unlike a, a novel, you, you take this snapshot, and I guess I'm asking how something would start, how you, you start this character and then move them through this life at the same time, uh, giving us a glimpse of what they are, the total life, the total picture. Well, <clears throat> I write stories the same way I write novels, only shorter. And, and that is to say that I go looking for interesting material from my notebooks. And, and so there is one story in here called uh, Nothing to Declare. And, and I thought, because I found this in my notebook, a story about a man who meets a woman in the city of New Orleans, a woman whom he hasn't seen in 25 years and was briefly in love with. What happens when such people meet? So there is a kind of, in, in, in establishing a premise like that, there is a sort of what if aspect to it. I have these two people meet in the Mudleyon Hotel in New Orleans, and then I send them out on a, on a, on a little journey on foot around New Orleans. And I, what I wanna find out is what can I make them say? What can I make them think? What can I make them react to? What can I make happen? So that's just generally true in every story I write. Well, I would say I've read the, the book twice. And the first time I read it was sort of uh, just a basic narrative, A to B, you know, get to the end. And then the more I read it, the more I thought about it, it became almost a vertical story. It was that as you immerse yourself or become, uh, become submerged in the story, things open up, things are added that have nothing to do with the forward motion of the story. In, in the crossing, which takes place over a couple hours, a ferry boat ride between Wales and Dublin, uh, opens up on a reflection to, of uh, a past relationship in college. Uh, the, the speculation about, he's looking at three women across the deck who are on the way, on the way to a concert in Dublin and what their lives would be. Uh, it's almost as if it's a, it, it's a painting. It's an artist that has the canvas on the easel and could go and work at it every day. Do you, is that somewhat Much. accurate or? Oh, I think it's quite accurate. I mean, I, I usually think that the, the analog to the way I write fiction is painting and, or it could even be sculpture. <clears throat> um, the analog is not necessarily narrative in, in nature because what I do is, as I said before, I sort of go through my notebooks, which I have been keeping for 60 years, go through my notebooks and, and look for things that I would like to stick into stories. You know, a, a certain line of dialogue, a way a person looks, a premise, uh, set, a, set a story on a ferry, um, C3 American women. And, and then what I try to do is I try to, and almost mosaically put it all together so that I, 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 use, I use the old Ruskin, the old Ruskin directive, which is, that composition is the arrangement of unequal things. So when I'm making stories up, I assume a sort of narrative going forward. I can make that happen. I can just push that. But what I'm trying to do is put interesting things into the stories. I, as I say, I can make them linear, but what I can't make them is interesting unless I can find interesting things to stick in there. Oh, but that's the compliment to you. And I've, and I've most people don't have the luxury of reading it twice, but I, I was really, working to prepare for this. And the, the second time, I mean, I saw all sorts of things I didn't the first or emphasize things. I have another question is just about uh, the story leaving for Kenosha. And this is a story, it's post Katrina. Uh, it's, a, it's a man who's taking his daughter to a dentist before going to the lower ninth ward to give her a chance to say goodbye to a, a schoolmate friend who's gonna move to uh, Wisconsin. Now, the story is a man and his daughter going to the Lower Ninth Ward and get to say goodbye. And you put a dentist in there, Francis Finnerty, uh, and he's Irish. And I'm going to get to that in a minute because Ireland is all over this book. But yeah. he is a man who wanted to either become a dentist or a, a priest. priest. Right. And <laughs> And a lot of talk about him going on silent Catholic retreats, reading Kierkegaard, Thomas Merton, 
Yeats as philosophy. It's, it's a wonderful aside, not essential to the straightforward narrative of the, of the story, but it, that's an example of, uh, I think what you were talking about, just taking something out of a notebook and inserting it for, to enhance well, the story. But I, guess, I guess my notion of a plot, Bill, is if I can follow one good sentence with another good sentence, follow that sentence with another good sentence, that's as much plot as I ask for. If I can keep you interested at whatever point you become aware that you are in the story, then that's really all I need to do. Um, that, that piece of business with Francis Finnerty, <laughs> I, I have a dentist in New Orleans who's my great pal. And so I thought I would give him a little cameo in, in, in the story because it was gonna be in the New Yorker. I, I wanted him to have a little cameo in the New Yorker. and. Um, uh, and then um, at some point, the little girl says about the, about the dentist, she says, he's an asshole. And her father said, no, 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 he's not. And, and it and actually kind of bothered my friend, the dentist, that the little, the little girl <laughs> said something about it. It wasn't very nice. And so I went back into the story, and took him out and put somebody else in in his place. <laughs> I hope it makes him happy. I bet you he was Irish. Uh He's actually yeah. Italian. He was Italian, but, the, but Finner he's Irish, Irish now. He's, he's Irish now. Oh, he's Irish, Irish in, the, in the book. To me, he's Irish. <laughs> to you, <laughs> I've never seen him, but he's Irish to me. Uh, I've known you for over 25 years. years, and you you were sort of succinctly between Bourbon Street and New Orleans and Montana right. when I knew you initially. And now, uh, here in 2021, Ireland is all over this book. Francis Fennerty, a, a dentist in New Orleans, is Irish. Uh, the the wife uh, is in the run of your life uh, is Irish. She's married to a, a lawyer from New Orleans, and and uh, they're at summering in Maine. But she's Irish. You have two stories in uh, that are actually in Ireland. Uh, a good day and and. Uh, uh, crossing, which we were just talking right. about. Uh, how is how does Ireland come so often into this collection? Well, my family's Irish, <clears throat> for one thing. They're, they're Irish Protestants from County Cavan, and but long left, long left, they left in the 19th century. Um, but many of them lived in in Arkansas, where they lived long enough to be in my life. Um, but more particularly, about um, 15, 18 years ago, <clears throat> Trinity College asked me if I would come and be a professor there. And I, of course, was dying to come and be a professor there. And so I went. And so for quite a long time, I was a, I was a sort of back and forth professor at Tr in Trinity College. And so during that time, I, I'd, I'd been to, to Ireland lots of times before then pushing books, but I had never gone over there and spent a, a lot of time. And so at the, when I started going to Trinity, then I started spending, you know, months and months over there and uh, living there and having a car and being able to get around and, and meet lots of people. And of course, the Irish were particularly friendly to writers and they were friendly to me. And, and so that was, that was the sort of nexus of the whole thing, which was going to Trinity, which was really one of the great pieces of good fortune in, in, in my life. And one of the great characters, I, I didn't mention him before, but he, he's not a character because he's dead but mick reardon in, <clears throat> in happy uh, right. is an irish larger than life editor probably a compendium of a number of people that you have known uh, i think that's probably true but also it's, it seems like there's a lot of opinions you have about publishing that come through uh it's, it's possible the, the deceased possible. mick reardon uh well mick as you say about mick reardon he, he really was a <clears throat> He really was an agglomerative character. I mean, I put a little piece of piece of this and a little piece of that, which is, as I say before, always my my way of doing things anyway. And so, I, yeah, I had some I had some lines and I had some I had some faces in mind. And normally, I don't do that. Nor normally, I, I I don't go looking for real people because real people don't don't behave very well when you put them in stories. They keep wanting to be themselves. And, and so, so I have to I have to completely denature them in a way, so that when I get them into the story, I can make them do what I want them to do, not what they would do if they were, you know, actually in the story. Well, I imagined a, a lot of people that I knew 
Uh, well, then you probably are right. And also refracted through what I know about you. And, and uh, that helped. Another thing that it, it's just a comment, but it's what I, you, you, these are all sort of upper middle class successful people, although a lot of lawyers, uh, <clears throat> Jonathan Bell is a petroleum engineer, uh, the sort of disgrace, Jimmy Green is a banker, but you, these are uh, very uh, sort of upper echelon professions that don't enter into the story, but define the character, provide a framework or an imagined framework <clears throat> around them. Uh, and you've always done that. Is there a reason for that? Uh, give, give them professions? Yeah, give them a yeah. profession that's really not part of the story. Right. Well, you know, long years ago, I, I wrote a book called Rock Springs, which is all about people who were in the sort of, I won't say demi mind, but they were definitely working class people working on railroads. Some of them were criminals. We're about and, to talk uh, about that. And, and, and so I, in, in a way, I, I got as much said as I needed to say about those people. And, and so I, my, my life is like most people's lives. I bump into lots of people. So somehow or other, well, not really so much by design, these people, these people began to be lawyers and, you know, hedge fund, hedge fund guys and politicians and <clears throat> Yale graduates and upper middle class white guys, and um, by and large. Um, but the truth is, two things. I'm never completely persuaded by a character unless I know what that character does for a living. And, and, and that's just right out of my childhood. When my father would come home from his job, he would talk about all of these people he worked with or knew on the road because he was a traveling salesman. And we only knew them because of their jobs. This guy worked for Nabisco. This guy worked for you know um, somebody else. It was always who they worked for, which made them plausible to me. The other thing is about lawyers and sort of upper middle class people, I want to have characters who into whose minds and mouths I can plausibly put the smartest things that I know. And so, and so I, I choose those people. And I think it's, you know, I think it's probably a little bit of a liability to write about, you know, upscale white guys, particularly these days when being an upscale white guys is, you know, not the most interesting thing in the world to be, but it's, you know, but, but my, my, my redoubt here, Bill, is, is if I can write a good sentence about somebody, if I can put in someone's heart something interesting, it doesn't matter who that person is because all of us at all scales of life, in all races, in all genders, um, we all are the same. You know, you mentioned this is the second time you've already mentioned putting sentences together, consecutive sentences. And I watched your Library of Congress interview with Marie Arana, uh, the Washington Post, and she and you immediately said she asked you it was the corollary question to the story the plot the the what we know of the book the the content of the book and equal to you was the the language the stories the words and i i hadn't heard that amplified as much as you did in that interview, how important that is, how you work and uh, very much equal to the plot. It sounds, I don't mean it to sound trite and, or that it's obvious, but uh, you work hard at it and it's also very noticeable, uh, rich language of the books. Well, <clears throat> I'm dyslexic. That's one thing to start. And so I read very slowly <clears throat> and I read every word and I often, well, I, it's, it's true, not often, it's always true. I can read uh, aloud about as fast as I can read silently. So that when I started being a writer, uh, I read my own work slowly. I read John Updike's work slowly. I read Joan Didion's work slowly. And what I realized was that there were qualities of stories. And, and I was reading Bartholomew May at the same time and William Gass and these great writers and Bellow, of course. And, and I realized that, 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 that reading one word at a time, words themselves actually become quite palpable. Just the non-cognitive qualities of words, how many syllables they have, how many vowels they have, how many fricatives they have, how many glottals they have, how many, 
how long the word is, how does it look on the page, all that to a slow reader such as I, uh, all that's part of what the word is and what it means. And at the pace that I write and at the pace that I think and read, I can be as attentive to that as I can to any other formal feature of a piece of fiction, because I think that's where the rubber meets the road for people who like to read. That we, whether we articulate it to ourselves or we don't, we like words. Well, and that for that reason, I would strongly recommend your books just for that, to pick up any one of the books because they're, they're rich in language and, and always have been. Um, I just want to open it up to the, uh, the two sides of your, the, the two genres you write. You're a short story writer. You're sort of, my first impression was a novelist. We met during Independence Day and the yes. Frank Bascom books and, and later Canada. But you're more than the equal of a short story writer. And do you see yourself as more of one or the other? Well, I, I guess I do. I, I, I think I think of myself as a novelist first. And it's probably because of ancient days when I was trying to write stories back in the uh, late 60s and I wasn't any good at it. And I didn't really get even reasonably good at it until about 1979. So, you know, 10 years. So during that 10 years, I wrote two novels. And so that was for me what I was. That was my vocation to, to be a novelist. And I kind of appended writing short stories to that previous uh, commitment. And, and I did, I only did that because I had all these pals who were story writers, Ray Carver and Toby Wolf and Tim O'Brien and Ann Beattie and Joy Williams. And, and they were all writing these wonderful stories and they were getting published in the New Yorker and they were be, being read all over and they were being asked to go give readings in places and have a hell of a good time. And I thought, I'm missing out on something here. There's a, there's a part to being a writer, which is not just staying at home, writing these 200,000 word novels. You can write short stories. And so, because Carver and those guys were my pals, uh, it became possible for me to sort of learn a bit at their knees. But I was also, you know, from the South, from a literate, from a literate part of the world, as far as great, you know, the production of great literature is concerned. I wouldn't say the South was otherwise normally literate, but um, but so I I had I had the feeling that writing short stories and writing novels were not so different, other than just their lengths. So it didn't it didn't it didn't challenge me with something I didn't feel I couldn't do. Yeah, well, you actually merge. I mean, we're gonna you're really well known for Frank Bascom from the sports writer turn realtor, turn realtor and then lay of the land. But then when you get, uh, let me be frank with you, uh, you took a character you'd written three novels about and turned it into novellas. Four novellas, yeah. Four, four novellas. Uh, is that a story in the last novel you wrote was Canada, right? About eight years ago or published about eight years ago. What a horrifying thought. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm in the middle of a long novel now, as we were saying before, so I, I better yeah, hurry I will, up. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll talk about that at the very end because <laughs> it's, a, it's an appropriate theme. Uh, but is it just something that happened if, between lay of the land and, and staying with this character and moving him up 10 years, uh, very similar to what Updike did with Rabbit Angstrom, yeah. that at that time, the novella fit better than just a full-length novel of his life in the mid, uh, you say, t 2015 or whatever it was. Right. It was. It was about 20. It was about 2014. That's that's pretty close to right. Um, you know, my general feeling is, if you're a writer, you write, and sometimes you write this long, and sometimes you write that long, and sometimes you write middle long, and so you know you can kind of you can kind of um, over finicky. Uh, yourself a little bit when you start talking about genres. I mean, I mean, for me, genres are not terribly interesting. The whole notion of genre is not terribly interesting. What's interesting to me is that I can finish it. What's interesting to me is that I can make it hold the most important things that I know. And, and sometimes you have a little more and sometimes you have a little less and sometimes you got a whole bunch. And so, I mean, I mean that's my general sort of Approach. I mean, I'm much more of a I'm much more of a bricklayer than I am an architect. Are you so, is, does that correspond to is that the way you are as a reader as well as a writer? In terms of the enjoyment, what you look for in a story. Yeah. Or, 
Yeah, it, 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 it really is. I mean, um, it's, it's also my, my taste as a reader in general as being very Catholic, which is to say, I'm, I'm not a person who just, who just reads science fiction, in fact, although I don't read science fiction at all, but I read all kinds of fiction and all kinds of nonfiction and all kinds of stuff. I live with somebody, my wife reads everything. And I think if I hadn't married her 53 years ago, I think my, my reading tastes would be much less broad, much less diverse than they are because she's an urban planner. She's interested in all kinds of things that I wouldn't have known about to be interested in. And so it's, it's largely, I think, because of her, because we live together kind of isolated. We don't have kids. We talk about stuff. And so <laughs> she talks about what she reads. I talk about what I read. I want to talk about where you came from. You're you're from the South. You you lived in Jackson, Mississippi, Little Rock, Born Arkansas. There. Uh, when did you uh, when did you start reading? When did you become a serious reader? Nineteen, <clears throat> nineteen. Yeah, I managed to go through high school and not read a book, which you could do very easily in Jackson, Mississippi. Like there may be even a premium on it for for all I know. Um, I was the opposite. I, I, read, I read all the books but avoided high school. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have yeah I have a similar view of high school from the one that you have except I went <laughs> you, <laughs> but I started uh, reading you know I got into college I got into Michigan State I I think as uh, as sort of a charity vote uh, I, I had been in trouble with with the police and with the law and was, and was having a difficult time but I didn't I, I didn't score terribly on these on these standardized tests and my father had recently died and I wanted to get out of Mississippi because I was I was on the wrong side of the racial issues that were going on down there. I was going to get in trouble. So I think they let me into Michigan State as a sort of condiment sort of to the general people who go to Michigan State. And it was there I learned to read. Only well, that's, really there. Right. That was the 19. And, and you I mean, you went there, as I recall, as hotel management. Your, yeah. father, your, your grandfather had a hotel in Little Rock, Arkansas. You worked right. on a railroad for a while. I did. And then... Uh, were you, were you writing at Michigan State? Because I know the next step is Irvine. Right. Well, I did every, I did the thing that kids do. I was going to law school and did go to law school subsequently. But so I was taking a, a real big, I was taking basically two majors at the same time. Uh, and one of them was English. And, and to have a little break in my curriculum in English, I, I, I took a creative writing course just so, just so I didn't have to study. So I, so I could sit at night uh, in the Sigma Chi house at Michigan State and uh, write short stories in my little room. And, and that's really where I did the first kind of anything like that. And then what was the decision to go to a writing school, a serious writing school, and the acceptance at the uh, University of California, Irvine? Well, the decision was that I'd, that I'd been briefly in the Marine Corps and didn't get very far in the Marine Corps, but I, but I did get out of it with a, with a discharge. I finished with that. I'd gone to law school, didn't like it. I tried to get jobs in the winter of 1968. And I finally looked around and I thought to myself, what have you ever done that you haven't failed at so far, but that you also like to do? And writing stories was the only thing I could think of. And I said to Christina, this was the week before we were getting married. She said to me, she said, what do you think you're going to do once we get married? Reasonable. And I said, I'm, I'm going to try to write stories, be a writer. She said, oh, that's great. She said, that's a really good idea. Let's do that. So when, when she sort of gave me her thumbs up on that, then I just looked around to see where I could get in. And Irvine was new at the time. And so, you know, they probably didn't have enough applicants to fill up the class. So they let me in. Another condiment. It's, well, it's still a great writing school. One of your professors was Edgar Doctorow, E.L. Doctorow. Was indeed. Was, uh, how big an influence was he? Well, he was an time? influence in, in the way that most writing teachers are influences if they're good at it. They teach you how to conduct yourself. Uh, they don't, they don't, you know, they don't teach you black letter law about, about writing stories. They put in front of you all kinds of good stories and think that you will read them and absorb what you can absorb. But they are in a way models of decorum. And Edgar was a good model of decorum. He was he was he was a, uh, a cont well-contained man, very brainy, very articulate, but generous. He was an extremely generous man to, to us students, and so 
that's what he taught me. That's what all of my writing teachers taught me. They taught me how to how to behave. Not that I have necessarily always followed their their their, their rules, but I I've done my best. And you come out, and uh, I know you you wrote a couple novels. Back in the, the mid seventies, wrote a couple novels, and then uh, gave it up. You became a did. sport as just like the title of the book. You became a sports writer inside sports. Inside Sports, which was, uh, I think it's probably published in Chicago now, or it was for a time. At, the, at that time, 1980-81, it was published in New York and was a, uh, a property of Newsweek. It was a terrific uh, magazine. It was good, because they let the likes of people like me and Donald Hall and uh, all kinds of people who were not normally sports writers write sports. And, and, and a, lot of, a lot of writers, a lot of poets, a lot of essayists, they're really knowledgeable about sports. And not 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 to the extent that you know Mike Wilbon is, but but to the extent that they kind of live sports in a passionate way. And so we had some we had a nice time for about two years writing for Inside Sports. And indeed, I was going to talk about your academic or your uh, your teaching career in a bit. But when I knew you at, at Northwestern, and this was, you know, it went at the really the in the aftermath of Independence Day, you were a really yes. well-known novelist, but yet at Northwestern, you taught magazine writing. I did, I did, because they let me. And I thought it would just be, I thought it would just be, uh, it would just be a wonderful experience because what I had always wanted to be when I was young, but was never allowed to be when I was young, was a journalist. And so um, when, when, I was, when I got to Northwestern, I did teach in the English department or in the writing department, but they, but they 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 took me over to Medill and, and and made me a journalist and, and let me teach let me teach feature writing and it was great it was just wonderful. No, I remember. I, that. I could, I saw quite I could do it. I could do it at Columbia now if I wanted to. I'm a professor at Columbia, but uh, there's not much time. It, it takes you know. I don't live in New York, so I have to get to New York. So what I would like to do isn't always what I can do. Well, this is the way you got to Chicago right now. So that's right. Um, the one part of your life, it's a huge part of your life, I haven't mentioned yet, but you did, uh, with Rock Springs and the Upper Plains, Montana part of your life, which has been, since I've known you long before, I mean, Rock Springs, a collection of short stories goes back to uh, the early 80s. Yep. Uh, how did you come to that? A boy from the South ended up in Montana. I married Christina, Christina Hensley, and we were living in New York. And um, uh, she, she was getting sick of teaching at NYU. And one of her graduate students said to her, well, why don't you get out of, get out of academe and go take a job someplace where you can actually practice what you're preaching to us. And so she simply applied for a job to be the planning director of the city of Missoula, Montana, and she got it. And, and I was in the middle of writing the sports writer. And I said to her, mm, well, wait a minute, we were, living in, we were living in Princeton and living in New York. And, and I said, how am I supposed to write this novel set in New Jersey if we're gonna live in, we're gonna live in Missoula? She said, oh, you're a writer. She said, it, it won't be hard, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll do it fine. So, okay, we moved to Missoula. And, and so then those stories began to be available to me uh, quite adventitiously and, um, um, and happily, because I, I, I knew from nothing about Montana. But one of the things that you have to do as you get older as a writer, you've got to, you've got to depend on things other than just what you natively know from your childhood. You have to appropriate things. You have to, you, you have to learn things and, and command them. And so the, the West and those landscapes and those characters and those situations were situations and landscapes that I appropriated. And I know when we set up this interview in the, it must have been like in November, a couple months ago, you were actually in Montana. Do you still, are you still out there every year for a time? We are. We go out every uh, September and we stay till the 1st of January uh, in Billings, not, no, no longer in Great Falls and no longer in Missoula, but in Billings now where we have a house. It's, it's largely, I think, to go pheasant hunting. Christina likes to pheasant hunt and I like to pheasant hunt and I've got some pals out there and we go pheasant hunting. And I, and I, you know, 
move myself and my work out there just as I would if I were going to. Well, you drove. I mean, recall you driving. I mean, in the, I drove. in the middle of the pandemic, you, you made it from Montana back to Maine. We did. We did. We did. Well, thank, thank God for Hilton Garden Inns. That's all I can say. Great. <laughs> breakfast. We can't have the breakfast buffet anymore. Not, but uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, there, there are ways around these things. You mentioned uh, academia. You have spent a long time. You always have that academic affiliation. Uh, well, since I've known you, I mean, it's been Princeton or Bowdoin or University of Mississippi or uh, Columbia now, Trinity in Ireland. Uh, yeah. Is that something that you always have as uh, an adjacency? to your writing life? You know, I, I, I was an unlettered kid growing up. I didn't know from nothing. I had a real, I had a real regard for teachers. My teachers were great teachers and they saved my life. And so, <clears throat> and I love literature. I love reading. And so I can teach literature. At, I don't teach creative writing. I teach literature at, at, at Columbia. Um, and so it's, 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 I mean, I don't want to say it's any, it's anything charitable on my part. It's not giving back. It's 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 actually just I'm happy in the classroom with students. I, I really like that, and uh, it doesn't take up much of my time. I teach one course in the in the winter, one half of a course in the fall. They pay me good, so um, it's I don't know. It seemed kind of a no brainer to me to do it. What did you teach at Trinity, uh, the land of great Irish writers? What were you teaching there? <laughs> I was teaching literature, I, but I wasn't teaching Irish literature. They don't need me to teach Irish literature. I was just teaching world literature. We, we were looking at, you know, we were looking at short stories and we were looking at some essays and um, just, just the, the standard sorts of things I teach. I, I, I get what I basically do for people who want to be writers is I teach them to read. I, I teach them to, 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 to notice this and notice that, and notice that decision and notice the consequence of this choice. And that's what, that's what I do. Um, and it's, 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 it's actually great fun. Even on Zoom, it's great fun. No, it sounds like that. Uh, so never, never writing, are you ever like a faculty advisor? No, you don't want me as a faculty advisor because I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't give you good advice. I, you know, that, I actually thought of that as I was saying it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me. To, you don't want me as an advisor for anything. Well, here's the thing that you are an advisor for. You've had a a, a long career, and you are obviously successful at it because people ask you to do it again as an editor, as a short story uh, <clears throat> editor. Yeah, and that would seem to be in the face of. A conventional wisdom that you don't want to be reading someone else that would interfere with the thoughts about your own work. Yet you seem to have, well, you know, there are a lot of hours in a day, and 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 um, and and, and I, I wanted to because my wife was generous enough to let me not have a not have to have a full time job because she always had a career that she wanted to follow as a PhD, wanted to do that. I, I could not have a full-time job all the time. So I, I just wanted to have a sort of immersive life in letters. And, um, and she per permitted me, provided me the chance to do that. So my, my stories aren't in there. And it gives me a chance to write an introduction. And um, um, that's my most, you know, at my age now particularly, but for a long time before now, that's my most useful role in the world uh, to be a writer. But it's a, lot of, it's a lot of reading, more reading than you would normally have and a lot of discarding. And, um, I, but you know the old joke, you know the old Mississippi joke? Yeah, it's a lot of time, but what's time to appear? You know that joke? <laughs> well, I wouldn't have used that, but... Um, what are you? And I and I actually know the answer to this. You're looking for quality. You, the answer is if it's good. But what are you looking for when you're? These are stories that are not in book form. They're just probably in manuscript form. And you read them. What are you? What are you looking for in um, in a story for inclusion? 
I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for stories that take command of my attention and that re and reward that command of my attention by giving me something intellectually, emotionally, sensuously, some new awareness that I could have gotten no other way. And so it, 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 it doesn't subscribe to any, any, uh, uh, type of verisimilitude. It can be any kind of story. It doesn't have to be realistic. It doesn't have to be zany. It doesn't have to be one thing or another. But if it takes command of my attention, if it works on me, I mean, I, I you know, there readers like for stories to work on them and not be passive, to be authoritative. And so I'm looking for authoritative stories, but most importantly, I want a story that tells me something that's really important that I couldn't find any other way. And are you, have you done this recently? I know I've looked at a number of the Granta books and they're a bit in the past now. Have you done anything in the last couple of years? No, I haven't. But, I, you know, <clears throat> I think maybe um, my generation uh, for doing that maybe, maybe has passed. Um, I mean, there was a time for me to do that in the past 15 or 20 years, and maybe now it's a time for someone else to do it. Um, and so... I, I don't feel remiss in not having done it. The truth is no one's asked me to do it. If, if somebody asks me to do it, I might take a whack at it, but I, I don't know that I have kept up as, as religiously with the young generation of writers as I probably would need to, to be able to do that. So there would be, there would be some gearing up to do, but I, I wouldn't mind doing it, frankly. No, I think it'd be a, a, a great opportunity, you, a great discovery for you, I'd imagine. And then, um, then write another essay because writing those essays is great to write the essays. As introductory. The, oh, well, you've just answered the story. That's the reason. <laughs> that's yeah. the reason to do it. I want to uh, tie this all together with uh, it's called uh, the Hall of Fame hat question. <laughs> and this it goes back if you have a, a, a baseball player who has played for more than one team in his career and is equally associated, Carlton Fisk being for the Boston Red Sox, Chicago White Sox. Frank Robinson was with Cincinnati and later Baltimore. And Pete um, Rose, Pete Rose did too. Pete Rose, well, yeah, overall Cincinnati, Philadelphia. Right. But here's, uh, when you, uh, this is your Hall of Fame hat. Uh, what you consider yourself because of the geography of your life. You are a product of the South. You have always gravitated back to New Orleans. You have always, uh, the initial works were there. And then there's the upper plains of the Montana, which I mentioned. And now for 22 years, you've lived in New England. But then there's also, uh, I won't call it just Irish because Paris was yep. the equal to that, yeah. but um, as a, a widely traveled man, what is the uh, what is the hat that you wear? Uh, in a short statement about you, what Christ are, Christina are you Ford's about? husband? Very Christina good, husband. very uh, good. Because it, it, I home for me is wherever is really wherever she is. I mean, this is Valentine's Day, so that's really a big fat pitch for me, but it's really? also our 57th anniversary. So I, I'm, I'm, but, and that's, that's just the truth because as you say, I, I've lived in all these places and but we've lived in all those places. And have identified with them. Yeah. So it, what, what is, what is, what is continuous about those things and, and what is, what is always unique about those things is that I'm there when she's there. Well, thank you. And I was, I was going to mention that about uh, Christina and also, um, going back to sorry for your trouble with all the trouble that these people have had with <laughs> divorce and and uh, yeah. widowhood and every every malady and, and uh, some something that sort of dinged every one of the characters is something that you're the antithesis of uh, you know you know Marsha Norman's had, had a wonderful line um, when she said if you want to if you want to write a good story write about the things that scares you the most that's all those things, all those troubles. Yeah. Those troubles scare me. Yes. And meanwhile, you're doing just fine. You look great. Uh, thank I'm, you for being I'm here. Upright. Uh, I'll ask Aaron. Uh, we could keep going. Or Aaron, do you have uh, people that want to say something? Well, hello. 
we do have a few questions that we've got some great ones too so um i and so those of you raising your hands it's really easier if you type your question in first um that way i can not look at three different things and just just two actually um this is coming from either joan or jeff or joan and jeff Petterell. if you would like to unmute yourself you can ask your question yourself hi i uh no no camera my uh, question was, I, I have heard Mr. Ford a couple of times, he said today and, and elsewhere about putting one good sentence after another. And, and I think that's so important. And that's why I keep, keep reading you. But I, I'm wondering if there is any difference in uh, what I put into the, the question was your pals. When you talk about uh, Tobias Wolf and, and Carver and Ann Beatty, uh, short story writers, is that where they're going? And is that different than what the, the people who primarily write novels, those who you have uh, colleagues who write novels, are, are they look, are they more the architect rather than the bricklayer that you say you are? No, but, you know, Jeff, the truth of that matter is that I, I don't know. Um, you, would, you would think, you know, that, that we are all, all of us been doing this for 50 years that we would get together and talk about that. And actually, we don't do that very much, nor, nor did we ever do that very much. So I mean, Carver, Carver used to always say that he would sit down and, and he wouldn't get up till he wrote the whole story. Well, I thought that was actually baloney. But, I, but, I, but, but you know, and then I, I know uh, <clears throat> Deb Eisenberg, who's somebody whose work I greatly admire, she says that she sits down and just starts writing sentences and she, didn't know, she doesn't know what the hell she's gonna write at all mm -hmm. until she writes the next one. Me. I bone up and I I study and I I, I gather information and I'm I'm just almost immersed in the material of what will be the story. So, truthfully, how all these other people do that uh, is slightly mysterious to me because I could never do it. I'm sure the way they do it, if I even knew how they did it. Hmm. Thank you. That's really interesting, um, Steve. All. Steve, I'm gonna I'm gonna call you Steve A. Uh, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, sure. Um, uh, thank Hi, you. Steve. For I have two questions. Uh, one um, for Richard, and happy early birthday, by thank the you way. Very much. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, taken by surprise, or what did you think of this? Uh, really, the great success that you had with a sports writer. Were you expecting? Uh, that level of success. And a quick one to Bill, uh, are we going to do a White Sox game this year? <laughs> oh, I'd love to. I'm very enthusiastic about the Sox this year. Yeah, you you and Wilbon. Wil Wilbon's also enthusiastic about the Sox. I think he's worried about the Sox, actually. <laughs> um, you know, Bill, uh, Steve, um, no. I, I was just so happy to get that book published. I, as Bill had said, I wrote two other novels, which he didn't say this, but it's nonetheless true. I wrote two other novels prior to that, which didn't really attract any readers. So uh, this book came from uh, as a success from out of nowhere. Uh, I mean, I I had to learn to I had to relearn to write novels when I wrote it, but but I had no earthly idea that it would find a readership. Thank you, Steve, so much. I wonder what percentage of novelists do write a book. Or, or, or screenwriters or, and they're like, yeah, this is it. This is the thing, you know, like how many of them just, just know that they've, they've hit that golden ticket and how many say that, and then it ends up being a dud, you know, it's just, yeah. it's interesting how, how <clears throat> you can have that foresight or whatever into your, into what you've produced. Well, you know, I never really had that kind of ambition. Um, I had, I had ambition to write uh, almost the best sentence I could write, mm -hmm. but I, I never had those sort of architecturally towering ambitions to be one thing or another uh, above my station. You know, mm -hmm. I, I thought my station was to be a guy who wrote one book at a time and did his best to write that one book at a time. And you hoped, and, and you did, you mm -hmm. hoped if it was published well and, and it got a little lucky that somebody would read it. But that, that, was the, that was the quiddity of my ambition. And, it's still pretty much the quiddity of my ambition to, to write one book at a time and try to make it as good as I can make it, hope that it gets published well, hope that it finds a readership, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's it. I, I keep my eyes on my toes. 
I, let me, can I read a question that's on the on the sidebar here uh, from Randy Albers? Oh, okay. And, and he's saying, uh, you mentioned your, re your reading of a number of writers and how they influenced you. Two questions. What did reading aloud do for you in your own voice <laughs> as opposed to reading silently? And what are you reading now? Well, um, well let's see. What, reading aloud allows me to uh, superintend every sentence. And um, but but it 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 doesn't it doesn't do much for me as far as the voice of the story is concerned because I have a voice as a human being. All of the books that I read over the course of my life have all kinds of different voices, and I can pretty well fit myself into the voice of each book as I write it, even though it ne isn't necessarily my own my own speaking voice. Um, um, so. It just allows me to be to be very very careful. That's what it allows me to do. Um, what am I reading now? I'm I'm, I'm reading uh, the Professor's House, which is which is really quite quite wonderful. Uh, I, I I love these stories of ne Nebraska and the and, and the Middle West, and uh, she's just such a great she's such a great novelist. That's great. You know, um, we had this conversation recently um, in our organization about how. Sometimes when you read thing on something on paper, oh, we were writing jokes for our gala, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. But, um, and someone, we did it out loud and someone said, oh, I did not think that was funny when I read it. But when, when they acted it out, I got the joke and I got the humor. But for your books, they aren't meant to be read out loud. They are meant to be read. And I feel like it's, it's such a different type of writing when you're writing something that isn't meant to be acted out versus something that is meant to be heard and spoken with, you know, the emotion and stuff like that, because that kind of helps the viewer or the reader understand oh, how, sure. how they're supposed to feel. So it's almost harder as a novelist because you really have to do it just with the words alone. I, well, I can People imagine. have been doing it for a long time though, Aaron. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a long tradition for it. And so I I never think of that as being a, as an as being an impediment that I'm not that I'm not there to read it to them. Yeah. I'm not there to put on the masks and, and act out the yeah. roles. I mean that maybe is what makes one a novelist rather than what makes one a playwright. Right. Um, that 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 I I I feel I feel that I can do it all with the choice of words and do it all with the length of the sentence and do it all with that kind of rhythm. Um, now, I didn't say before, by the way, Willa Cather. I didn't say Willa Cather before. I, I realized just going to ask you, yeah. Professor's House. I didn't say Willa Cather. Sorry. Do you do your own audio books? Do you do the narration for it, or does somebody else? No, that's you know that's a real professional's job. I've done mm -hmm. one, okay. and I I did a creditable job. Not great, I don't think, but um, I would do them, but they don't want to pay me enough money to do them. Got it. And, it. and it's actually arduous enough to do it that I would like to be paid a, a, a hideous amount of money to, to do it. And <laughs> then they don't want to pay me that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gary Lyons, I am going to um, unmute you. You've got a great question. Hi, Gary. Hello. Hello. This has been a great chat. Um, <clears throat> Thank and you, thanks, Gary. Bill, for Pleasure. alerting me to this. I'm a, I'm a neighbor of yours, Bill, and you told me about Oh, this, good. The I, Gary, hi. Yeah, I'm glad hi. you made it. Uh, yes, and uh, this has been great. I just wanted to ask you, Richard, if, are, are there any uh, contemporary Irish writers that you feel a particular kinship for or admiration for that... Uh, um, I'm going to name one for you, okay? Because I'm just going to... Claire Keegan. Claire Keegan. Oh, yeah, she's great. Oh, I mean, she's just... I mean, if I had to, if I had to name one young contemporary... Our, our Irish writer, writer, I would, I would name Claire. Um, and her short stories, would you, would you, her Antarctica series, and well, and Foster, her long, her long, yeah. her little, her little short novel called Foster is a, is a, is a, is a wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, it started out as a short story and became longer, and then the New Yorker published it and it became a little shorter. But now it's published by Faber. It's called Foster. It's about a, a woman, who, a, a girl. It, actually, it's a girl. Who is foster, foster? Who's fostered uh, mm -hmm. by another family? Um, yeah, it's fantastic. I've actually recommended that to my uh, daughter, and she loved it. So, uh, thanks, and yeah. thanks again, Bill. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Gary. We walk the dogs. We meet walking the dogs in the morning. He lives a block away. And it sounds like he might have been Irish. 
he is. Very and cool. His and his brother's a writer. Oh. There you go. There you go. Um, all right, gentlemen, I'm looking to see if we have any more questions, but we are hitting um, that time. I'm going to uh, give Richard, we talked uh, this morning about an upcoming book, another Frank Bascom yep. uh, work of fiction, and you said it does have a tie-in with Valentine's Day. <clears throat> I'm going to give you yes, the last word with that. It's, it, it does. It's set... Um, Valentine's Day, uh, 2020, hmm. and um, um, it's called "Be Mine," and it's and it's about it's about Frank and his son Paul going to the Mayo Clinic uh, because Paul is ill, and uh, it's it's and Frank is Frank is never very far from my age, and so he's he's a little younger than I am, but he's in his 70s and um, taking his son Paul, who is um, an un unusual young man and an unusual grown man, who is 47 now. And hmm. taking him to the Mayo Clinic to be to be treated, and so um, it's 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 like those other books in that it tries to subscribe to the Jamesian notion that there are no themes so human as those that reflect it. What does James say? Is those that reflect out of the confusion of life, the re relation between bliss and veil, between the things that help and the things that hurt. So it's it's funny, and it's about very serious things. Well, really, like when is the uh... When do you imagine that to be in it's, our hands? It's due. It's due the first of April, April Fool's Day. Maybe not the best time to have your book be due uh, it, on a year from now, a year from this spring. Well, we'll, I, we'll, we'll speak have, again, hopefully in person. Gee, wouldn't that be nice? Rather, rather That's than have wonderful. rather than have the people who's looking after my estate do it. Well, we want you to see the inside of the club. You were supposed to be here last June. Oh yeah, I'd love to. I haven't seen it either, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well it's still there it's just waiting for everybody to come back in safely so we can't wait to have both of you and over here we'll bump elbows yeah well bill and richard thank you so much for being here today on valentine's day on the 57th anniversary of your yeah. first date and i'm yeah. sure a lot of us got warmed up from this conversation and forgot about some of the troubles that are outside our doors so thank you so much for that and if anyone wants to learn more about our organization or to see more about our programs we have coming up, including every Monday afternoon, you can go to our website at www.19thcentury.org. If you want to make a donation, which will help us continue to put on amazing programs like this, you can do it right on our homepage at www.19thcentury.org. And you can also learn more about our gala, which is on March 13th. Well, for everyone at the 19th Century Charitable Association, Writing Matters, for Richard Ford, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Aaron. Bye.